Alejandro, uh, you're in charge of a new museum in Qatar. I would like you to speak about it. So it's the Art Mill Museum, and maybe we can start from the word mill. Um, this is the transformation of the old port, the uh, flour mills and silos facilities that until recent were closed to the public, were part of the industrial uh, front line of, of Doha, that on the occasion of the World Cup has been opened and it's being repurposed, retransformed to provide so that the city now reaches the ocean instead of stopping before, blocked by the port. The, um, it is in the what I would call the cultural district, the IMP Museum of Islamic Art is mm. one of the ends of the triangle, the recently opened uh, National Qatar Museum by Jean Nouvel. And then this uh, Art Mill Museum, which was the result of an international competition uh, that started back in 2015 and then was announced in 2017. And it's supposed to open when? Well, in, in principle, it should take a decade where Qatar wow. is still working on the next steps for the development. I mean, the, the port is still in operation. Uh, it's open, but still in operation. Uh, so let's say from the moment we're ready, let's count a decade, which is not something uh, that fast if we consider that the point of this uh, project is, and actually starts by a, by a question that we raised to ourselves to so understand the scale of the operation and then was presented to the jury, which is, is this a big building or a small city? And when it's both, because we compared the size of the site with the Tate, and uh, the Tate is one, one half of the length and one fourth of the width and around what looks, what appears is city, we compared at the same scale with Venice, uh, and again, the Corderia that is 300 meter long, it has a lot of city around for the same site, and also Kunstverein which, uh, in Germany, which is another transformation of industrial facilities into cultural institutions. Uh, so all of them, in addition to big buildings, are small cities. And for a city, 10 years, it's a very little time. So we have to have two strategies here. For the building, where you have to control your operations uh, uh, in every single detail because you're hosting a very valuable and precious collection. Uh, so, because you didn't say what this museum was, was for. So, let's say, we started first with understanding there are two logics involved. One for the museum, which is about control, which is in what we know where architects are normally trained. But when you're designing city, which is another uh, experience from our practice, you initiate the process, but then you have to let go. It takes uh, over and the dynamics of cities are in principle out of control. You may coordinate the forces, but you can't control them, at least not the form. So regarding the building, uh, and again, before jumping into the exhibition space, there were existing structures. And uh, from the competition to the finalizing of the concept design, we had more detailed surveys. So we have been uh, identifying more and more structures that can be kept. And that is important for the carbon footprint. footprint there's embedded energy that we wanted to keep. But also because it, it adds to the history, to the identity of the project. In a nation that has a very recent building, even if it's an industrial facility, it has a history. It has a, it has a presence in the local culture. It's where the bread is produced. The smell of the place, for example, is connected to the memory of the Doha citizens. Mm. But in any case, we started from the silos and that was the DNA for the design, meaning the silos are these columns that are packed for their original purpose. And we thought that they contained the potential to become a forest of columns in which the first aim was to domesticate a very tough, harsh environment. So the question was, can we create shade without the roof? And the mass of the columns, as in old hypostyle halls, like Karnak, for example, is a strategy where uh, there are a couple of degrees less and the air goes through. So it's a better place to be in a public condition because actually half of the square meters are public space, which is another part of the strategy of our proposal. So we didn't start from scratch. We were happy to have those initial constraints from the soilers and just had to uh, develop them in a way uh, so that they could perform efficiently for exhibition spaces. You know, a silo, even the, for the expression, is a compartment that is con not connected to the next one. So in principle, things are isolated, and that's not the need for an exhibition space. So 
this is a very nerdy thing, but let's say from the extrusion, meaning that the octagon, original form of the silo that is extruded all the way up, we created a figure that starts as a square and ends at, as an octagon. And that square at the base allows us to have a grid that can uh, add to the neighbors to achieve <clears throat> bigger spans, bigger exhibition spaces, which ultimately gives the flexibility that future curators may need for uh, uh, those gallery spaces. R that regarding the building. Regarding the city, the small city to the side, as I was saying, um, it has a different logic, it has a different strategies. And, uh, so you are there only not control the form, but try to channel forces that may be vital for the future life of this public space. It adds to the corniche and the most significant promenade where you, when you go there or that you have huge family, huge amount of families enjoying that. that. And, and then this matters because cities are measured for what you can do in them for free. So this public space, it's really relevant to have a quality and again to domesticate the environment. And there we were trying to apply strategies that we have found uh, around in the region, in the city itself, the footprint of old Doha as a relationship between mass and void, that there's no wonder has created the right conditions to be in outdoor spaces uh, in a comfortable manner. So again, the footprint, the uh, how narrow and shaded the streets are as part of the city, but then the programming is, we took all the programs of the museum that could serve when the, for the public when the museum is closed. So trying to activate and try to avoid the blind box condition that sometimes museums have when they land into the city. So having a life for the public, let's say, with the restaurants, with the theater, with the art school, um, so all those programs that can work both internally for the museum, but uh, after hours for the city were put into place, plus other programs that have been appearing to animate this promenade uh, in the front of Doha. So out of these two, uh, I think we, we, we so had a point for the building. So you began really with uh, the local situation more than with the destination. Yes. You and... didn't think first about the museum. You you thought about what was there and what was uh, that it has to be a public space. Well, that's that's I wouldn't call this a method, but actually it's a way to think about a, a project that has it's at least it, it's the, the it's more natural for us, which is we try to identify and formulate first the question before jumping into the answer. So designing the question takes us a couple of, let's say, weeks. We shut up we listen, we try to hide whatever may have been in our, you know, back of our minds and an agenda, because out of the toolbox that has to be as wide as possible, you then pick up, pick up those that are pertinent for the question that you have identified. So sometimes the questions and these forces at play range from very concrete, very pragmatic issues, like building on the, on the seaside, on the ocean, the quality of the soil, so that we create uh, a resistant structure. It has to do with functions, it has to do with uh, thermal mass and the environment, but it, it goes all the way to intangible dimensions of the, of the form, because in the end, the question is, what informs the form of the project? And, and that type of information, it's sometimes concrete, but sometimes it's intangible. It's, it's the character of the building. It's the kind of things that matter a lot. Maybe it's the thing that people, that hits first people. I mean, what's the mood of the building? Oh. Yet, you cannot talk about it. So it's an unspeakable certainty. You know, but you can't explain it with words. So with all those forces identified, only then we jump and make <clears throat> the proposal in front of the blank page, that normally when you have identified those forces properly, what you have is a complex question. And what you would like to do, the more complex the question, the more simple and synthetic the answer, the more need for synthesis. So if there's any power in design, that's the power of synthesis. You don't cancel those forces. You have to integrate them, even though they normally pull in opposite direction. So the, not only what the museum should look like, but also what's the environmental strategy, what is the material, and what so is the expression. And so what's the result? Well, the result, 
is the building. I can I can make a report and talk, but in the end, what makes the work is the form. And in this case, <clears throat> yeah, the form is what it is. You if if you, in your blog you can show the images, what you will see <clears throat> is this forest of columns. Mm -hmm. This Jamusharavilla, uh, which is the grid that allows air to go through, mm -hmm. so that you domesticate the, the not only the temperature but also the light. And as important as, as what you see is what you don't see. You don't see glass from the outside. In this environment that is very tough, the moment you have glass exposed to the sun, what you create is greenhouse effect. So it's, it's, let's say from that point of view, it's not a shiny building. It's an opaque building. The thermal mass is in the perimeter. The structure is the architecture. Um, so in addition to this forest of columns, uh, that our aim was to Mm, to make it difficult to understand that, say, in a hundred years from now, when this was built, would this be, was this built in the 11th century, or was will it be built in the 31st century? We we one if you're going to spend energy, spend it only once. So we wanted to make a structure that lasts physically, but also culturally. So the moment you have a very clear, simple structure and the the silo DNA offers that clean, that's that neat uh, approach to the, how to spaces are defined, then we have more chances that so that in the future, uh, generations of curators of, uh, of public will, will make a more flexible uh, and open use of the space. But in any case, <clears throat> what I was saying, what you don't see is glass, because if the, ha the sun heats the glass in this environment, then you create a huge greenhouse effect. So yes, the pertinence of the environmental strategy was crucial. And in addition to this forest of columns and the glass that you don't see, there's this sloping platform where the creative village is. And in this village, again, the footprint follows the old strategies of cities in the Mediterranean and also in the Arab Gulf, uh, where the ratio between void and mass creates naturally shaded spaces, uh, naturally ventilated, so that the public space uh, is treated without the use of any machines, the lowering temperatures before having to start to put machines from 50 to 35 degrees in the summer, but also with a pertinent landscaping uh, that uses the slope to accumulate humidity and moist so that we have more than a landscape architecture is the trying to understand the forces of the ecology of the place and let them take over the place. These are the big forces that you better agree with. And it's part of this equation where we are trying to understand the forces that will inform the form of the building. And, but uh, everyone is, is longing, is waiting for, the, for seeing the collection. So you create the, the boxes for the collection. Uh, did you think about that? Well, we had to respond, or at least we thought. We, we have never done a museum to start with. So ah. I guess, uh, and that was already a very bold move by the client, by the jury, by the sheikhs. Uh, <clears throat> but it's, it's, for us, it's m more or less normal. Normally, we go into projects that we have no idea at first. When we started doing social housing, we had no idea what social housing was. And, oh. and if you're rigorous with your ignorance, then you may raise those stupid questions in that in charged fields. Uh, you don't take anything for granted. You start again because you don't know about it. And eventually this allows you to move in a direction that maybe it was uh, just forbidden. You know, you don't know why. Um, so regarding what we understood as outside this from this, uh, from the exhibition space is that you have two forces to give one example that are pulling in, op in two opposite directions. On the one hand, you want to create uh, a background and architecture has to have the capacity not to be the protagonist. The protagonist will be the art and the public in, in a relationship with the work of art. So there, there's a dialogue in between the two entities. So architecture is mere background somewhere here in the back that creates the right conditions for that communication to take place. It should be as silent as possible so that the dialogue is it's, it's direct, it's, uh, that it connects. But that may lead to a neutral, generic white box that is 
all over in the world. And then the other force at play is that you would like to understand that you are in a specific location with a specific collection, collection so that when you are having this conversation, it happens in a place that takes from the local identity, takes from the conditions of the place. But then if the volume of that is too loud, then the architecture becomes too present and too, uh, uh, too much of a protagonist, and then it may affect the dialogue. But it's not just the uh, clean, uh, spotless box, nor something that has so much noise that the protagonist, people, and art uh, uh, cannot have this, this dialogue. So how to, how to combine the both? And, and this is <clears throat> when we're, for example, structure, big spans, no columns, nothing interrupting the dialogue, so that when you want to create inside rooms that are small, they can be built and unbuilt without creating debris or rubbish. So it has to be flexible enough. So the structure uh, is closer to bridges than to architecture again, and it's connected to the infrastructural nature of the existing place. But at the same time, it's accept accepting that part of the square meters are not new, are not our own responsibility, are, are the silos. We provide with a very specific and unique shape that eventually for art is not business as usual, a round shape, 8.5 meter wide. Uh, but again, it creates a condition that is so unique, so spe special that it's going to be memorable. And, and this mix of being flexible and neutral, but memorable, memorable and, uh, and um, yeah, specific at the same time is what we were trying to balance and th synthesize in the project. What about the light? We have two or three different conditions. Being the upper floors uh, exposed to natural light, we take advantage of that. And well, the amount of light, the amount of looks in the, in the region. So our challenge is not to capture out, outdoor light, is how to prevent the light from disturbing too much inside. So with small punctures, which is good also for environmental performance because you have less thermal bridges in between in and out, then you allow the light, natural light, into the rooms uh, to conquer the space so that you also have a notion of the passing of the day or the passing of the seasons, which again is local. It's, uh, it's not the generic box equally mm. uh, uh, illuminated. But in the lower, uh, in the lower levels, we have this uh, composition by layers. So inside you have the protected or if wanting a curator, wanting an isolated uh, place for exhibitions. But the next layer is the circulation. The next layer are these uh, veils to have light coming in through in a very soft and subtle way. So again, up to the curator would be how much of that light can let be uh, go through. We have a very, a very long and, and uh, big relevant central spine orientation is relevant in a big museum. So at any given moment, you, are, you can relate from where you are in the exhibition to the central space of the building, which at the same time is a domesticated source of light to bring inside without a direct radiation, but just the light that may be necessary. But again, that decisions are more on the curator side. We are just creating the possibility, as many possibilities as possible uh, with the with the infrastructure, with the bones and, and flesh of the building, but then the life will be uh, yeah, the curators, the exhibition, the public, that actually more important than coming to the exhibition is coming back to the exhibition. So, the, <laughs> so the, the, how many public spaces, amenities are there so that you can make it as a family uh, But activity. it doesn't depend only on you. It also depends on the program. But the program is up to us to be placed in the right position and to defend the, the We're wrapping around, let's say, the more neutral exhibition galleries with all the programs that can serve, as I was saying before, both the, the museum internally, but also the city outside after yeah. hours. So all that will enable for this to become uh, a destination for, for regularly com families coming back because it's just a nice public space, a collective space, and not only a specific exhibition gallery. And uh, were you inspired by some museum created recently? Or? Well, given the pre-existence was so strong, uh, we were inspired and actually the constraint, uh, constraint, constraint are great for, for the creative process. I mean, because you have constraints, you have to be creative. Uh, otherwise you can do whatever you want. And uh, 
So being arbitrariness, um, one of the biggest threats in architecture, uh, the more constraints you have, then the more you have to think about carefully why you're doing what you're doing. Uh, so if you were, of course, we have studied many exhibition spaces, many galleries, I've visited many museums, I'm an outsider, you want to make sure that you are not making mistakes uh, b because you're, you're inexperienced. So you were, we swallow huge amount of information, but also visiting museums. Uh, but at the same time, you want to pick up the lessons that you learn from those with with a very little care otherwise you go against what you have there i mean the silos are there i mean they they offer a physical resistance which is fantastic uh so instead of fighting that you want to understand what is missing or instead of you know transforming too much the silos accepting their nature and what is missing be created in what is new and one of just to mention one i mean it, it may be a very stupid thing uh but uh, <clears throat> what I observed while visiting a lot of museums recently, uh, what we've witnessed uh, over and over in the news there in the corner of the world are all these attacks on art. So uh, for, for different uh, agendas, be it the climate, be it uh, inequalities, be it the war. Uh, so activists come to the museum and throw soup or throw paint or glue themselves to wall. So there's, um, it, let's say, if, if before how to steal a work of art may have been one of the biggest threats, today how they're going to be attacked are a threat. Uh, as a consequence, what I, what I witnessed that, uh, in this recent visit is that the wardrobe, the place where you have to leave your bags and your coats, that it it was an option, it was an optional, let's say. Yeah. Now it's a must. So who, who, have, who, who have said, would have said that uh, nowadays the size of the guard row has to be huge because every single citizen has to leave their stuff in there. And if it's placed in, a, in, a, in an underground level as a kind of side entry or an optional entry, then the whole experience of going to communicate with the work of art where you're coming with a lot of expectation, all of a sudden you go through the back door. But I noticed that you didn't speak about one museum that you admire. That I admire? Uh, so, let me think. Um, it can be an old museum. From, from old museums, the Louis Kahn's galleries is something that we're always here in the back of my mind before being in, in commission, uh, a museum that's uh, the clarity and the simplicity of the structure and the relationship of the served and uh, serving spaces, which is something that we are applying here. One of Some of the functions of the silos is to contain all the facilities, uh, uh, emergency stairs, shafts and conditioning so that the served spaces can be as clean as possible. It may have a different shape, but the same strategy of serving and served spaces mm. is coming from Khan museums. Um, then um, um, another museum that may have caught my attention recently. Um, well, well, not that I come that come to my mind specifically, but yeah, we visited uh, so and many museums.